<clears throat> all right. Aloha. Welcome to All Good Things in All Good Time, where more often than not, I'm not trying to find terrible things to view, you know. And by the way, don't expect me to go anywhere near that disaster zone anytime soon. It's one place I'm not bringing my camera or myself for I don't know how long, but I'm in no hurry. I'm assuming everything where I live is burned to such a crisp that I do not need to go sift through it hoping to find something. Although I'm fantasizing about that. I'm fantasizing about, you know, some papers at the bottom of a stack that somehow didn't burn through or so, I don't know, anyway, whatever. I'm also just imagining everything I own, like a CSI slow motion scene burning slowly, you know, the fire crime scene show. <laughs> anyway, it's weird. Okay, these are just probably natural side effects of the experience. So I'm in my hotel room, I'm not even gonna show you outside because you're just gonna say, oh my God, he has it too good. But yeah, uh, I'm in Kalina Poly Beach and ocean's over there. I don't really know if I wanna get in it. No, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not inclined to want it. You know, potentially be somewhere where there's some pollution, especially that kind of pollution, considering it's things we don't wanna talk about. So uh, I'm gonna show you, this is my video of everything I saved, okay? What would you save? Well, I don't know. This is what I saved. I could have done a better job. I had this premonition that I was gonna need to do this. And so I'd had a couple things right at the front door, <laughs> ready to go, you know? Like sometimes you think, well, you're gonna stash something that's valuable, but I had it just right by the front door, which were some stuff I'll show you here soon. Like a, in, suit, in a suitcase and whatnot. So um, I just wish I'd had more time to work off that premonition because we had a near fire burn the house down experience like a year and a half ago and it kind of put that seed in my mind and I'd kind of been working on it but not well enough but I did have three things backed up ready to go which were uh, I'll show you anyway so and this is gonna be a long video <laughs> okay because it's gonna come with some stories stories about things that were on paper that if I don't tell them now you know if I get in a car accident right now no one will ever know this story, maybe, right? So, et cetera. That's what I'm gonna tell. So, be patient uh, and hang in there. <laughs> By the way, these are my new things. Food, amazing, look at this. <laughs> look at this stuff, this dragon fruit. Kale, these beautiful tomatoes, eggs at the, uh, you know, where there's food. So, all right, well, uh, in my car randomly, uh, some goggles, an Xterra cup, that's totally gonna come in handy. Uh, and you know, the like. All right, there's some other new things I got. I just went and bought this stuff at Walmart, a coffee maker, a, a fan. I got a stove to cook off of, and I was given one pan, that's all I really need, and I got a little rice cooker. So, and this is all new stuff too. If you don't know this product, it's a zero water, smartest product ever. It takes the parts per million down to zero. <laughs> and if you go back on my channel, you'll see me, I drive across the United States, with that product comes this, a parts per million water tester. So I tested water all across the United States. Uh, and that's one of my 25 kinds of content. Um, no one's really taken an interest to it, but long story short, uh, the worst water I tested in America was um, Roswell, New Mexico, 630 parts per million. The best was Portland, right out of a city tap, 14 parts per million. Second best was on the Donner Pass rest area, 30 parts per million. And then the third best was at a rest stop in Virginia, 60 parts per million, anyway. And then you put it through there and it's zero. And there's talk of contaminated water, so what better thing to have right now, right? And you never need plastic. If you have that with you, you can take any hotel water, turn it into pristine, beautiful water. So, and it's, it, it, it probably has an impact because it's such a good filter on PFAS chemicals. Although those are parts per trillion and it's really hard to get that stuff out. So, um, my God, this is basically all my stuff. I'm gonna talk about all these things. A painting, me on the cover of the Auburn Journal, uh, my daughter's soccer team, generations, a picture, old picture books, baseball cards, all sorts of stuff, more baseball cards and stuff. Um, 
I started the day thinking, okay, I should get some clothes. I started putting them in here, and all I put in here was one work uniform, and then I never got back to clothes, so that's the only clothes I saved. But if you're from Malibu, this is the book I use. This was uh, Michael Land and Johnny Carson's favorite restaurant. Um, I once served the whole cast of Rent there. Met a nice guy that allowed me to come and watch it. Uh, he gave me a, a VIP pass, and I it's pretty cool. Anyway, um, and that guy, uh, Doogie Hauser was there. Um, and uh, that was cool. I cried at a stranger's wedding at the Beau Rivage with Doogie Hauser present. I know, totally cool. <laughs> anyway, and then I never put anything else in here. I threw this in the car, figured it's a good piece of luggage. All right, as I was saying, I had this right by the front door. I've been buying some baseball, basketball, football, Pokemon, <laughs> soccer, you name it, hockey uh, cards. So, uh, unopened packs, and uh, that just might help me in my recovery. Uh, I do have a, U a uh, eBay channel, and I'm thinking I'll, I'll sell stuff on eBay. Um, or try to, uh, hopefully you guys will want to do it and then it won't be like, you're just giving me money, but this might help me, you know, get back a few things like a mountain bike and a road bike and <laughs> just some other, uh, the pre-sorted cards that were in boxes, but I had a lot more of these. I had like stacks of cards I wanted to get graded. That's basically what these are. Um, so that's cool though. It makes me feel good to have some baseball cards basketball cards football cards these are my binders that i made 30 years ago during the junk wax era so that's cool those are most a lot most of the cards that i care the most about but still lost a lot of cards these are the, my graded cards i had a few of those I went with the wrong company hga probably should have gone with psa from now on i'm gonna send everything to psa to get graded um, I carried out a couple food items, artichoke carts. I figured I could just eat those out of the jar. It's a protein. <laughs> of course, I had to bring a can opener too. A machete, my phone, and my tablet. Um, I, may, I, may, I had like 20 pounds of coffee. I'm like a child of the depression after um, after uh, the pandemic. So I had 20 pounds of my own mix of coffee. Right? It's. Uh, Colombian, I love, it's got Sumatran, just a little bit of hazelnut, and uh, some Guatemalan, and um, some Colombian, and it's a great mix, I just love it. And I, so I just made, check it out, it's my first cup of my coffee. It's one thing you're always gonna need, is coffee, in fact, Listen, when there's a disaster in the future and you're going to buy something to donate, buy a coffee maker <laughs> and some and some filters and buy coffee so that the person who just got electricity can fan for themselves. All right. So let's get into this right here. Uh, the Auburn Journal. 19. Oh, I need some glasses. Excuse me. Excuse me. with me glasses. Okay, here we go. Uh, so, Auburn Journal, this is one of my, something I would, I could never replace. August 14th, 1991. Just ridden my bicycle across the United States for a good cause, raising awareness for missing children. After I do this interview, the interviewer, by the way, lies on the ground and takes a picture up through my handlebars. I'm wearing a garbage bag. And uh, I had just ridden my bicycle there from New York City all the way to California. I was only well, 150 miles away, 200 from my final destination. And then the next day, I went to the 49er training camp and got the hookup. I'm standing outside. I was, I was told where the office was. I was right there with my bike. Dwight Clark comes by, gives me a... Gives me an autographed picture. That just burned up. Um, <laughs> that's why a lot of things in stories are, oh, and that's burned up. So so uh, then uh, R.C. Owens comes up, like the, I think he's the inventor of the alley-oop, but he ran the 49er training camp, you know, back when they were winning all the Super Bowls at the at the Sierra College, right? So I, I show up to Sierra College. Uh, R.C. Owens comes up, says, 
son, come with me. R.C. Owens brings me in his office. Like, hey, you want something to drink? Have a seat. And then football players are coming up, and he's like, hey, man, I want you to meet Craig. And then uh, it was KGO day, and he's like, hey, man, we go talk to the KGO people. They're our sponsors, and uh, they're all in this room right now. And so I went in there and told my story. And then, uh, and then um, what happened? And, uh, and then they're like, oh, and then I got to go through the lunch line, man. I had freaking Tom Rathman on my left, Bubba Paris on my right. Oh, I was in heaven. It was so great. Anyway, um, yeah, that was cool. So, and then they were like, hey, man, you can come back the next day and be a, and have a VIP pass. So I came down, watched practice. <clears throat> and uh, when Jerry Rice was coming off the field, nicest man ever. There. I got some stories about some crappy famous people. Well, Jerry Rice. A lot of players just walked by. There was a fence where there was just <clears throat> kids dying to get something signed through the fence or over the fence. And he came up there and signed every kid's card. In fact, he signed... Ooh, I hope I have it. Hope I... Hope I, I, I don't know if I have it. I might have it still. But he signed... I had a card of his. He signed twice for me because I only had one card. He was like... Got anything else to sign? Oh, sign the other side. So he signed the other side of the card. Like, I probably have the only, if I have it, the only Jerry Rice card signed twice. Anyway, so I had, this had just come out that morning, and so I got it signed, right? So we got Jerry Rice, number 80. We got George Seifert. We got Bubba, Bubba Paris. Uh, and uh, Bob McKittrick, the freaking coach, uh, Spencer Tillman. And on and on. Uh, Pierce Holt, uh, just cool stuff. So, and so that, and then there's the picture of me, my garbage bag. This is in the parking lot at the Auburn Journal. Meanwhile, like the next town over uh, is Nevada City, where my great great grandfather drew the first city map in 1860. It was published in 1869, but I imagine he was working on that before that. I just don't know how many years, but so. Let's just read the article. Craig Bradley, here, let me. Craig Bradley spent last night under the rain filled clouds in Ashford Park. He used a plastic tarp as a blanket, his shoe as a pillow. After about two and a half hours of rough sleep, Bradley climbed back on his mountain bike, laden with nearly 100 pounds of gear, and began rolling down. Rolling, excuse me, rolling down the Interstate 80 towards San Francisco. Bradley has been on his bike for the last two months, pedaling across the United States and passing out information about child abduction and abuse prevention programs available to schools and parents. When I decided to ride across the country, Bradley said, I decided to devote, <laughs> it's funny because the voice is me and it's my voice. So <clears throat> I decided to devote the trip to something positive, anything that contributes to the degradation of our children or our environment should be of utmost concern. They are our immediate future. Hell yeah. Nothing disgusts me more than the abduction of children, said Bradley. I couldn't conceive what the children or the parents must go through. Bradley pedaled out of New York City on June 10th. During his trip, he passed through the cities of Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Dayton, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri, Topeka, Kansas, Denver, Colorado, Reno, Nevada. At each stop, Bradley spent time out of the saddle, distributing flyers showing missing children and using the media to increase the public's awareness of the dangers of child abduction. Bradley plans to stop in Sacramento and Santa Rosa, spreading the word before crossing the Golden Gate Bridge and ending his trip 1 p.m. on Monday. Having no sponsorship, Bradley lives on $100 a week allowance for food. The whole trip has been perfect, he said. This is the only quote I didn't really like, and it's the one they highlighted, but the whole trip has been perfect. I've had the greatest fortune in meeting people, and there has been absolutely no fat. See, that, that, the use of the word fat, no, uh, you know, there's been no excess, like, better word. Because the point was, I just had enough to survive. <laughs> made it a challenge and kind of made it almost fun. So, if I have got one parent to exercise more caution than this whole thing was worthwhile, according to Bradley. Parents can take precautions to make their children less a target for abduction. Parents need to teach their children their full name, their, 
their first and last as soon as they are old enough to retain it, Bradley said. And they must also know how to call home collect. That's how missing children cases are solved. Also, parents should never specialize children's shirts, placing their names on it. It gives potential abductors the advantage of being on a first-name basis with a child. As horrible as it seems, said Bradley, there is a market for everything, including children. Bradley has made a point not to collect money for any of the children's groups he represents. However, those wishing to help contribute to the Children's Fund can do so by calling Ivana Denova at the Missing Children's Help Center, 1-800-USA-KIDS. But I also, um, and they just didn't put it in there, um, I was also putting out the number for the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and I represented them as well which was cool. At the end of this first trip, this is the second trip, I did it three times. At the end of the first trip, um, I ended up at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Alexandria, Virginia with Ernie Allen uh, and John Walsh from America's Most Wanted. And John Walsh was like, hey, bro. Well, he didn't say it like that, but you want to come watch my show? So I got to watch John Walsh make America's Most Wanted. I was the only audience member because the only other people there were FBI agents. <laughs> you know, he's he's got a lot of good security because he goes after the worst of the worst. So, anyway, that was cool. Totally cool. All right. Oh, look at my baseball cards. This kind of makes me happy. And if you don't know what it's like opening packs of baseball cards, it's like Christmas every time. Right? So, I got all this Christmas ahead of me. I had two water bottles. Right? Tablet. Which I'm going to be able to watch stuff on pretty soon. Okay. Now, this is my... Aunt's painting. Now this is cool. She was an amazing lady, Aunt Dolores. What was her last name? She was my grandmother's half sister. Ah, oh, it's not written on there. Must have got ripped off. Anyway, um, it's an interesting story. So check it out. Amos Carroll, up in Malta, Montana, had a beautiful wife and daughter. And then he was murdered by his neighbor. The uh, apparently the person who runs the um, cemetery in Malta, Montana, knows the story of Amos Carroll. Anyway, his neighbor murdered him. His neighbor was put in prison. Uh, his widow married the jeweler in town, like a year later, and then they let the murder out because the woman was whole now. She was married again, so. Why not let him out? <laughs> so that's kind of funny. That's, I have never been up there. I'm, I'm going to try to get up there. Maybe I'll make a video someday at Malta, Montana, at that grave. Uh, so so then my uh, great-grandmother became uh, a person with a stepdad. And, uh, and they had another girl, and that was Dolores. And she was in Mensa. She was a genius, an artist. She wrote freaking math books for... For in Braille for blind people, she was so smart. And she also loved to paint. And this is the only abstract painting she did, right? So cool. Like I'd love to, it's been through so much, but um, maybe someday when I'm sophisticated, I'll get prints of this made and sell it. And, uh, and the value will be there for both of us. You know what I'm saying? Um, so that's just cool. I just love this painting. It's always just seems so amazing to me, so special. Like it, like it's just a masterpiece. Anyway, so that's cool. Thanks, Aunt Delora. She's from Danville. Dolores and Jack. Okay. Onward, onward, onward. Oh, and back to. Uh, well, I got to start. Okay. Oh, look at that! I got a canoe paddle. Look at this. Okay. Fifty-two inches, carbon fiber. I put a little marine epoxy here for extra strength there. And I got a little here so it, to fight erosion. And I'm telling you what, I'm starting to get in shape. It's time to get back in an outrigger canoe. And that is going to change my life in the most positive. It's the greatest sport on earth. Maybe, maybe someday, if not right now, I will explain all the reasons why. The greatest sport on earth, without question, is outrigger canoe paddling. There is just nothing, nothing that compares. Okay. Here is seven generations of my family. Okay, comes with some stories. Thanks for your patience. Where are we at here? Only 19 minutes off. Oh, yeah, it's not too long. Okay, so Virginia Shear Bradley. No one knows the story. If you're a historian out there and you want to pick up on a cool new thing, 
that no one, this woman was the first woman in America to run for office and be elected in 1882 or 1884, right about there. In Nevada City, she ran for office and was elected to the Board of Education. I challenge you to look up who's the first woman in America to be elected to office. It's not her. They don't know about her, Virginia. She was one of the founders of the California Club, the first woman's organization in California. She gave speeches with Susan B. Anthony. She was the, um, this is the stuff that just burned up, so. I have to tell this story because it's no longer on paper. Um, she, um, she gave a speech from the steps of Nevada City um, Courthouse to a crowd of 39 with Susan B. Anthony. Um, <clears throat> what else? Um, her husband was the first surveyor of Nevada City. That was uh, Henry Sewell Bradley. Upstairs in Nevada City at City Hall, is the first map drawn, which is by Henry Sewell Bradley, my great-great-grandfather, and that was his wife. She was 16 when she married her husband at age of 35. This is her in her early 90s, all right? Amazing woman. Um, loaned her son, or gave her son, the money to buy a bankrupt mine, the Spanish mine. And he turned it into a world record setter, and it set the world on fire as the greatest mining engineer of all time. And that's why this house behind him is a 36-room house, three stories, elevator inside, built right after the earthquake in Pacific Heights, California. If it was still here, if any money had come from this family at all to me, that would have been cool. I got zero money. These, uh, it's a story of riches and fame, but n just so you know, my dad was like uh, you know, a spoiled brat growing up ended up becoming a narcissist, unable to really connect with people. And he ended up disinheriting his whole family and leaving it all for uh, this woman who was almost 30 years younger than him, who just played the long con job. Anyway, but great story. One of the most successful men in American history. <laughs> Controversially, interestingly, he was a member of the Bohemian Grove for a long time. He was friends with all the presidents. Uh, I have a, had a book. I could probably find another one. There's very few of them out there. It's called The Men Who Made Idaho. It says we couldn't win World War II without this guy. Two-thirds and three-quarters of all the tungsten and antimony that went into building our war effort came from uh, efforts of his. He, he was no longer around, but everything that he started ended up being what? And that he ran, became, right? So uh, Northern Idaho. We couldn't win World War II without Northern Idaho. And, and maybe this guy. Anyway. A lot, lot more. Uh, if you go to Juneau, Alaska, and you look across Mount Bradley, named after this guy, um, Frederick Worthen Bradley, FWB. This is Virginia Shear Bradley, Frederick Worthen Bradley. Um, great story. Uh, she married her husband when her dad was away for the weekend because he didn't approve. Anyway, oh, and her first Thanksgiving with her husband, who was nearly 20 years older than her, he asked, he, he, he asked her, told her to make a Thanksgiving dinner for him. She said, no. Like, you don't tell me what to do. She was such a go-getter, right? Totally independent woman, super educated. She, she went to Mills College, like, in its earliest days and completed all the known math at the time. And according to the account, I guess military math was a thing and where most were, the, anyway, the highest math maybe was being done. So she completed all of the military math, for whatever that means, and um, all know math. Of course, it was the 1880s, and mathematics wasn't quite as complicated as it is now, but still pretty awesome. That's why nobody probably messed with her in the whole education department. That's why she probably won. Just probably fierce. Go get her. Anyway, gotta love, gotta love this lady. I wish I had met her. Anyway, I talk about having amazing luck. I'm pretty sure it's because I talk about these people, and they, um, and they bring it down to me. Anyway, so that sets the stage, right? Um, this guy, my grandfather, I never met. He died in this doorway of a massive heart attack at the age of 55. But right before that, for about 20, you know, about 20 years, he made, he, well, he took pictures from his teenage years and then he was so into it. And of course he could afford all the camera equipment because that was his dad. And then he got into making films, right? And then he edited his own films and no one ever saw his films. They sat in a closet for 70 years. And then they were unearthed and a, uh, a family friend um, who had uh, deep pockets paid to have all that transferred to DVD. So what I've been doing is playing some of them and then 
filming the DVD and putting them on my YouTube channel. If you want to see the Rose Parade in 1940, if you want to see Sugar Bowl when it first opened in 1939, or North Conway, New Hampshire, the ski resort up there in 1939, if you want to see the Panama Canal, the, uh, the Smoke Tree Ranch, uh, <laughs> um, a bear feeding in Alaska. Anyway, some of these things I've got the... Uh, the Centennial in 1836, Texas, uh, Mexico, all around the world. Anyway, because of him being so successful, he could travel, right? And, of course, uh, his wife, which you see in these movies, lovely um, Gami is what they called her, Mary Parks Bradley. She told her, boy, hey, give me that grandson. And she had a staff. You know, she was so wealthy, she had a staff to help her. So she just took on her grandkids, told her son and his beautiful wife, hey, go travel. So they travel. Oh, I have, <laughs> I have, it's already published on my, I have him taking a surf lesson from Duke Kahanamoku in 1940, before Pearl Harbor. If you want to see Waikiki, before Pearl Harbor, in color, it's amazing. So, seven generations, right? Um, great, great grandmother, great grandfather, grandfather, dad, me, my little baby girl. All right, things I saved. And then this is a picture of my grandma on the beach, Duke's Canoe Club, uh, in 19, uh, it's probably 19, what is it, 1947? It's, the great thing is my grandfather labeled everything. See how my grandfather made this and labeled it, right? Four generations, four months to 90 years, da, da, da. That was all done by my grandfather, right? And... Oh, and then there's this, me coaching my little girls. That's my little girl, and that's me when I was coaching. Okay, so those are the pictures off the wall I grabbed. Now, these are the two photo albums I had. This guy made photo albums, okay, and this is so cool. Look at these old pictures. I have so much more of this. It's so special because no one was taking pictures back then. What is this, like a mining? Anyway, look, everything's labeled. Every person in it is labeled. The date is on it. Let's see if I can find something super cool. Um, but a lot of footage of mines and mining operations because that was my family's deal. But then other things too. Um, there's Worthen. Anyway, so you get the idea. In fact, I'll show you. The other one I think has... Um, oh. oh, look at that. My beautiful grandma, my dad, and his two brothers. This little guy, he's still alive. We might go visit him. He is a man up in the in Gasky, California. Ain't nobody knows where Gasky is. Look at the swim team, baby. I think. I don't know. I'll get into this. Um, I just got this from my brother. We have like 30 more of these things. It's amazing. And... Uh, one burned up that had freaking um, Christmas cards from the Rockefellers and the Hoovers. Wish I had that still because those were so cool. Kind of explains kind of the circles my great grandfather was uh, was traveling in. Okay, so this is just the 1910s and 20s, um, but check it out. It's pretty cool. I got some stuff in here. You can dig. Um, that's the Treadwell Mine when it imploded. Look, my grandpa was an artist, cartoonist. He was always sketching and things, but uh, he was on a couple football teams. They're interesting. Look at the sketches he made around the world. Okay, so this is what I want to show you. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. And then that, okay, this is the best. Stuff. Okay, so um, in Alaska. Oh, so my great grandfather was the president of the Bunker Hill Sullivan Mining Concentration Company, in starting when he was 28 years old because he was so good and so successful already at that age, of the world's largest mining operation, start to finish because they smelted their product, right? The Bunker Hill Sullivan Mining Concentration Company was open from 1888 to 1988. Anyway, he was the president from eight or no from no they were open yeah he was from 1898 to 1933 until he died. So 35 years president of that. But he's also the president of the Alaska, Alaska Juno Gold Mining Company, the Presbyterian Church in San Francisco, the YMCA, um, 
the uh, and the Treadwell mine, um, the Yukon Gold Mining Company, uh, a railroad company. <laughs> um, it was, and so this is, and there's a huge implosion at the Treadwell mine on Douglas Island in Juneau, Alaska, and that's a picture of it at the time. Anyway, cool thing though, right here. Check it out. Okay, my grandpa. What is that? Is that Lowell? Yeah, Lowell High School football team. What is there? Nine guys on the team. <laughs> but uh, Worthen, baby. That's my tough, tough grandpa that I never met. But I have movies of, thanks to him. And I'm starting. Oh, okay, I saved. So I'm going to show you how I saved those. So what's this? Yeah, more Lowell High School football team. Team's getting a little bigger. What is that? Ten guys. A action photo of Lowell High School football. Or maybe it's, yeah. And then, okay, all my, my grandpa's fraternity brothers. And uh, oh, let's see, my glasses are right here. This is a uh, active chapter of the Kappa Epsilon on Front Lawn, Berkeley, April, 1925. Um, cool. Cal's Mining Miners, 1928, Engineer's Day. 28-29, Brawl, won by 28 UC Stadium average. Look at that. Ooh, wonder what that was, the Brawl. Hmm? That must be interesting stuff. All right, what we got here? Jack Shaw, Pooch Terry, Newt Davis, Pat Murphy, Bob Miller, Russ Little Worthen, Dean Gibson. Senior class, Kappa Sigma, Berkeley, April 26th. All right. My grandpa met my grandma in an art gallery, I mean an art class at UC Berkeley. Knocked her hat off the hat rack and then said, can I give you a ride home? That's the story. Kappa Sigma fraternity, Berkeley, April 26th. There's a lot of people out there who have an ancestor in that picture. Carmel, May, 1926. I mean, come on, man. So cool. But there's, I think there's one more thing I, I know is extra cool in here if I can find it. Anyway, I think you get the point here. My grandfather might be one of the most prolific photographers in history that no one will ever know unless I can get this stuff. Like, I'd love to find a, somebody that's a, curator of a photography part of an art museum and create a whole um you know whatever of that guy um so now those movies that's what these are right here check it out this is my favorite thing in the world the grandpa i never met the hundreds of edited often color or black and white movies that have been put on dvds Makes me so happy to have these. Oh my God. And this one, I paid $500 for this one because there was one more reel to get done. And uh, I took it there to Phoenix where the guys do it and it cost me 500 bucks. So. But anyway, and then the, yeah. So that is, that's what I saved basically. Oh, there's one more important treasure. Um, more baseball cards, basketball <laughs> towels. I don't know if you've seen the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, but towels are the most useful thing on earth, so I figured I should have a couple of those. All right, and I got pictures of my kids. Soccer pictures. Baby pictures of my baby girl. And then pictures of me and stuff, but oh. Look at this lovely lady. Margarita Swarth Cortez. Ah, uh, that's the one. I should have never. That's the one that got away. There are a couple others, actually. Oh, oh, look at that. Mary Elizabeth D'Agostino. If I had kept her in my life, I'd have had a great life. Either one of those ladies was so amazing. I was so lucky to date the best women in the world when I was young. And if I had just married any of those ladies, oh, well, my life would have been great. Check it out. This is my grandma when she was 98 years old in Hawaii. Napila Canoe Club behind her, hanging out at the Canoe Club. So great. So great. That lady, so amazing. You're going to see all these beautiful pictures of her when she was young um, and movies of her. But she lived fully 
uh, aware and able. She she cooked me breakfast at 98 when I came and visited her. With my, <laughs> anyway, uh, she planned her own 100th birthday party, paid for it at the Marin Art and Garden Center. Right. Uh, she raised Appaloosa horses for... Uh, for 50 years of maize. She was the president of the American Hereford Cattle Association in 1949. What a tough bird, right? Probably the only woman in the organization and the president of a cattle organization. So when she came over to Hawaii, she wanted to look at the cows. And my grandpa wanted to make movies, but they had different interests. Um, uh, but uh, just an amazing woman. So she, she planned, paid for this great 100th birthday party for herself. Everyone was planning on going, and then just before her birthday party, one month before her 100th birthday, she passed away. So she lived 99 years and 11 months, and then went out painlessly with a stroke in the middle of the night, and um, never needed help from anybody her whole life. Just an amazing lady. Um, raised Appaloosa horses for 50 years. Prize horses. Amazing lady, and beautiful Hereford cattle. And, uh, yeah, let's see. What else we got in here? There's a picture of a windmill from when I rode a bicycle across the United States 30 years ago. <laughs> anyway, just random pictures. Oh, look at that. Look at that. My boy. My cute boy. What a good-looking kid. He works with me at the restaurant I work at as a waiter. He's a bus boy. It's so cool. Oh, look. Grandma. Anyway, I got some pictures. I got more pictures in here. That's good. So, all this stuff fills me up inside. But let me tell you, constantly, you know, you, you, you travel through <laughs> the things that you don't have, and you think, oh, shit. Oh, my comic book collection, damn. Oh, like the genealogy for my grandma, all that stuff, I lost it. I know all the genealogy for this family, but I had that, and I hadn't, like, <sighs> totally backed it up and figured it out and anyway and then other stuff like that just it's a bunch of oh shits you know you're like you're like um you know look let's look in the mirror there you go you're like you're like oh shit oh yeah that oh my cd collection because i was just ah oh, i have four i've i have four cds in my car a lauren hill cd pennywise acdc and uh, a Wyndham Hill, like, instrumental, lovely thing. And those are my only four CDs, and I really like those CDs now <laughs> a whole lot. It's like, oh, that's right, I still I got four. Anyway, uh, yeah, and uh, couldn't get hungry, so I'm gonna make a, a I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you how, I'm gonna take a couple ingredients from the free food and take it up one notch, two notches, like four, maybe f take a five notch, take it up a, a five, five notch. Okay, it's gonna be a, Disaster relief cooking video. <laughs> All right. What can I tell you? Life's good. Um, oh, yeah. But I do have some some clothes. Look. <laughs> I have a few clothes. It's pretty exciting. Funny. Anyway. It doesn't take long in an experience like this to realize that, um, you know, although it's very dear to me, stuff is just stuff. And eventually... It would all get lost. I was hoping to write a book with a lot of this stuff in it, so I may, st may still do so as best I can from memory. Um, and so, I don't want to tell you. Thank you for watching. Um, thank you for your concern. Thank you for your interest. Um, you know, who knew that, uh, my, you know, that day was going to go like that and then life would go like it has since and and it's kind of surreal suddenly. I mean, just imagine like suddenly you're in a hotel room on the beach in Hawaii, on, in Maui, the, in Kaanapali, right at Black Rock. The hotel's free. Everyone's being compassionate and nice, excuse me. Um, and uh, there's three free meals a day here. Um, People are reaching out. I'm so stuck. One of the greatest things about this horrible experience is all you nice people and my friends, my old friends, people I am going to freaking look up and uh, and hang out with now, more likely because of, of this. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to look for and find, and that is one of them, all the ways 
you know, I can draw positive things out of losing all my stuff, which is nothing compared to these people that lost their every their lives, the people that are burned, the people that uh, lost everything, the friends that I pulled out of there with shirts on their backs. I mean, my God, I just can't imagine. I can't. So, and I'm comforted by these few things few things anyways life is good you know all you got all you can do is do your best to have a good attitude so it's a good day to have a good day right all right let's go get america remember do no crime do no harm be nice to people right let people go in front of you be happy to say you first <laughs> all right hello oh. oh i got one joke i got one joke let me this is a good joke don't catch you off guard you ready for this? So in the in the shelters, uh, they had all these snacks, and uh, one of them was these. These are Japanese. These are really good, really good crackers. Japanese crackers. <clears throat> I didn't I didn't know they were Japanese crackers. I thought all crackers were white. <laughs> all right, boom, bah. All right, thanks guys, aloha.